From New York, this is Democracy Now! There are elected officials in this room today whose homes and families were shot at in a despicable acts of political violence. Election violence continues at home. In New Mexico, a former far-right Republican candidate and election denier has made his first court appearance after being arrested on charges of orchestrating shootings at the homes of four Democratic officials following his election loss. We'll speak to one of the officials whose home was shot at, as well as the New Mexico Secretary of State. Then we'll look at Azerbaijan's month-long blockade of the disputed area of Nagorno-Karabakh, a home to ethnic Armenians. The closure of the Lachin corridor is a provocation. Its goal is a new military escalation. And there is no need to take steps that are desirable to those drafting the military escalation scenario. And meet the Earth scientist who was fired from her job at a federal lab for her climate activism. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. New research finds human activity has caused temperatures in Greenland to rise far beyond levels seen in the 20th century. The study in the journal Nature found that without immediate action to stop global heating, Greenland's melting glaciers will raise sea levels by 20 inches by the end of the century, flooding coastal communities around the world. Researchers studying ice cores found the decade spanning 2001 to 2011 was the warmest for Greenland's ice sheet in a thousand years. Temperatures in some parts of Greenland now average 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The United Nations secretary generals condemn fossil fuel executives for deliberately misleading the public about the threat posed by their products. Antonio Guterres made the remarks in an address to the World Economic Forum in Davos Wednesday after a new study found Exxon was aware of the link between fossil fuel emissions and global heating as early as the 70s, but spent decades refuting and obscuring the science in order to make maximum profit. Some in big oil peddled the big lie. And like the tobacco industry, those responsible must be held to account. Today, fossil fuel producers and their enablers are still racing to expand production, knowing full well that this business model is inconsistent with human survival. U.N. Secretary General warned the Paris Climate Agreement's goal of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius is, quote, nearly going up in smoke. Guterres said without further action, the planet's headed toward a 2.8 degrees Celsius increase. Later in the broadcast, we'll meet the Earth scientist who was fired from her job at a federal lab for her climate activism. In Ukraine, the Russian mercenary firm Wagner Group is claiming its fighters have captured a strategic village outside of Bakhmut. The city in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region has been nearly decimated by weeks of intense fighting. On Wednesday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky appealed to allies to speed the delivery of tanks and other heavy weaponry to Ukraine. Zelensky spoke by video link to government, military and corporate leaders assembled at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. The supplies of Western tanks must outpace another invasion of Russian tanks. The restoration of security and peace in Ukraine must outpace Russia's attacks on security and peace in other countries. Zelensky's call came as U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin traveled to Berlin for talks with his newly appointed German counterpart. The Washington Post reports German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has agreed to send Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine, but only if the United States follows suit. This comes as the Biden administration is set to finalize a military aid package to Ukraine with $2.6 billion worth of additional weaponry, including first-time shipments of striker combat vehicles. Meanwhile, The New York Times reports the Biden administration is considering aiding Ukraine in a military campaign aimed at retaking Crimea, which Russia occupied since 2014, even if such a move increases the risk of escalating the war. 
The International Atomic Energy Agency says it's placing inspectors at all four of Ukraine's nuclear power plants in order to safeguard against a nuclear catastrophe brought on by Russia's invasion. On Wednesday, IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi toured the Chernobyl nuclear power plant again, which Russia briefly occupied last year. We certainly hope that there will not be any further uh, occupation or attack uh, on the plant. Uh, my efforts are aimed at uh, avoiding that, and by having a permanent presence of the IEA, we are taking a very concrete step in that direction. The International Atomic Energy Agency is continuing to call for the establishment of a nuclear protection zone around the Russian-occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which has repeatedly come under fire over the past 11 months of fighting. Belarus has put exiled opposition leader Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya on trial in absentia for committing treason. In 2020, Tsikhanovskaya ran for president against Belarus's longtime leader, Alexander Lukashenko, after her husband, Sergei, was jailed while running for president. Svetlana fled Belarus after the election. She denounced the trial as a farce. First of all, I have to say that uh, uh, in Belarus there are no honest trials. Uh, we live in absolute lawlessness in our country. So tomorrow's trial uh, will be on me, will be farce, show, but not uh, like real justice, you know. In a remarkable victory for progressive activists, New York's Democrat-controlled Senate Judiciary Committee has rejected Democratic Governor Kathy Hochul's nominee to become the top judge in New York state. In an unprecedented move, the Judiciary Committee voted 10 to 9 to oppose the nomination of Hector LaSalle, who is the first Latinx judge ever picked to head the New York Court of Appeals. Numerous unions, as well as civil rights, immigrant rights and reproductive rights groups, had opposed LaSalle's nomination, citing what they described as his past anti-labor and anti-abortion rulings. LaSalle's backers included House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. Microsoft has announced plans to lay off 10,000 workers in the largest round of job cuts at the software giant since 2014. This builds on approximately 120,000 job cuts over the past year at high-tech firms, including Twitter, Meta, Lyft and Salesforce. Meanwhile, Amazon said Wednesday it'll lay off 2,300 workers in Seattle and Bellevue, Washington, part of a plan to slash Amazon's corporate workforce by by 18,000. This comes after the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, cited Amazon with failing to protect workers at three warehouses against ergonomic hazards, putting them at risk for musculoskeletal disorders and lower back injuries. A warning to our audience, our next story contains graphic images and descriptions of police violence. In Indiana, lawyers for the family of Herman Whitfield III have released body camera videos from the night Whitfield was killed in his parents' home by Indianapolis police officers. Whitfield was an award-winning African-American piano virtuoso who would have turned 40 years old last October. Early on April 25th of last year, Whitfield's parents called 911 to ask for help as their son experienced a mental health crisis. Six armed police officers responded to the call. Whitfield family lawyer Richard Waples says the videos show officers failed to call an ambulance and did not bring in mental health professionals as the family requested. Instead, they responded with deadly force. They tased him. Then they got on top of him and cuffed him up and kept him prone down, even though he was crying out he couldn't breathe. All this was captured on um, the body cam videos, which the police then would not let us have. The Marion County Coroner's Office later determined the cause of Whitfield's death was homicide. The city of Indianapolis and its police department fought for months to pluck a judge's order that raw videos of Whitfield's killing be made public. Herman Whitfield's mother, Gladys Whitfield, said Indianapolis police instead released a highly edited and narrated video which did not show the whole story. In my opinion, the police department has been anything but transparent concerning the circumstances of our son's killing. 
And uh, in my opinion, IMPD has taken every opportunity to obscure the facts and present a distorted view of what happened. Whitfield's family has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Indianapolis and the six officers who responded to the 911 call. In Atlanta, Georgia, protests against a planned police training center known as Cop City escalated Wednesday when police say they shot and killed a man who was part of the demonstrations. Police said they were conducting a major clearing of protesters who occupied a wooded area outside the center when they were fired on, claiming they fired back after an officer was wounded by gunfire. Hundreds gathered at a vigil Wednesday night to mourn the protesters' death, where they disputed the police account. Longtime Atlanta activist Kamau Franklin tweeted, we need an independent investigation on the killing of this protester. Why are SWAT teams in the forest with Georgia state troopers clearing a forest, he tweeted. Six protesters were arrested Wednesday and charged with domestic terrorism. And New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has announced she will not seek re-election and will step down next month after more than five years in office. I know what this job takes, and I know that I no longer have enough in the tank to do it justice. It's that simple. Prime Minister Ardern drew international praise for her handling of the COVID-19 pandemic after her government stamped out the coronavirus for months until vaccines became widely available. She also drew praise for her compassionate response to a white supremacist massacre in 2019 that killed 51 people at two mosques in the city of Christchurch, New Zealand. Shortly after those attacks, Ardern led a successful campaign to ban military military-style, semi-automatic and assault rifles. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Hi, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we begin today's show in New Mexico, where new details are emerging about a former far-right Republican candidate who lost his bid for a seat in the New Mexico State House by a landslide this past November, but refused to concede his loss, was arrested by a SWAT team Monday for orchestrating shootings at the homes of four Democratic officials. Police say the suspect, Solomon Pena, paid four men to shoot at the homes of two county commissioners and two state legislators. This is Albuquerque Police Acting Commander Kyle Hartsock. After the election in November, Solomon Pena reached out and contracted someone uh, for an amount of cash money to commit at least two of these shootings. The addresses of these shootings were communicated over phone. Within hours, in one case, the shooting took place at the lawmaker's home. In the series of attacks, Bernalillo County Commissioner Adrian Barboa's home was shot at multiple times on December 4th. On December 8th, incoming New Mexico House Speaker Javier Martinez's home was shot at. Then, on December 11th, the former Bernalillo County Commissioner Debbie O'Malley's home was shot at. Finally, on January 3rd, New Mexico State Senator Linda Lopez's home was shot at. No one was hurt, but the bullets from a Glock pistol did fly through the bedroom of Lopez's sleeping 10-year-old daughter. Solomon Pena is accused of trying to participate in the last shooting himself, but his gun jammed. He appeared in court Wednesday to face multiple charges, including aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, criminal solicitation, and four counts each of shooting at an occupied dwelling. Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller said the shootings were politically motivated. I also know that, fundamentally, at the end of the day, this was about a right-wing radical, an election denier, who was arrested today and someone who did the worst imaginable thing you can do when you have a political disagreement, which has turned that to violence. Authorities say Pena actually visited the homes of his four targets in the days prior to the tax and tried to persuade them his election had been rigged. Video obtained by the Albuquerque Journal appears to show Pena at a former residence of one of those targeted, former Bernalillo County Commissioner Debbie O'Malley. Doorbell camera footage shows him asking to speak to her. 
Hi, my name is Solomon Pena. Can I speak with Debbie O'Malley? Okay, well, the public record says she owns it. Uh, do you know where she lives? And then he went to the house where she lived. It was that house that was shot at. For more, we're joined by two guests. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, Debbie O'Malley joins us. She's the former Bernalillo County Commissioner in New Mexico, was one of the four Democratic elected leaders in the state whose house was attacked in the shootings, allegedly orchestrated by Solomon Pena. And in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we're joined by New Mexico Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver, who is a Democrat. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Debbie O'Malley, let's begin with you. So we see this video footage of um, Solomon Pena going to property you own, asking for where you live. Can you talk about what happened then on the uh, what happened next? You actually spoke to him. That was well before uh, your house was shot up. Yes, uh, it was uh, right after uh, the uh, residents told him where I lived and and. That's not unusual. Uh, we, once in a while, constituents will, will drop by for some reason. But normally, people are very respectful of, uh, of I think, elected homes here in, in Albuquerque uh, and don't want to, you know, disturb them while they're at home. Uh, he did go directly to my house. Uh, there's a video where <clears throat> he shows, uh, shows him approaching my gate. And, uh, <clears throat> and then the there's a clip also where I, I meet him there. He's waving his arms, trying to get my attention. So I walk over there to talk with him. And uh, that's when he, um, you know, tells me that he felt that he was cheated out of the, the, uh, the election that he had actually won, that it was rigged. And uh, <clears throat> he said, I knocked on all these doors and, you know, I should have more votes. and. And on and on. And I did tell him, you know, that doesn't mean that you get votes if you see people or knock on doors. That's not the same. You know, it doesn't equate to votes. And he became very agitated and he had me a stack of papers, not a big stack, small stack. <clears throat> I, I did scan them uh, after I received them uh, and uh, on my way back uh, into my home. And I could see that there was a letter, you know, stating the same things he told me and that he wanted my response. You know, immediately, I did see the rest of the papers scanned them, and clearly those had been downloaded from a website uh, that taught, you know, that, <clears throat> that um, moves the, the, you know, the narrative forward about fraud or fraud. Debbie O'Malley, describe what happened on the night of December 11th when your home was attacked. And of course, this would be, you know, a month later. <clears throat> Well, my husband and I were sleeping. It was the middle of the night. I think they determined it was close to two o'clock in the morning, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we heard this loud banging. And I described it as someone, you know, knocking on our door with their fist. It was so loud. We both sat up at the same time, <clears throat> and um, we heard more of that sound. And we just realized it was it was gunfire. We did get up. Uh, I did look to see. Uh, uh, where, where my uh, the gate cam was, and uh, it didn't lit up. No one of the state security lights were light, were lighting up. We figured nobody was on the property, and uh, went back to bed. And uh, my husband didn't discover the the uh, gunshots on the wall, the holes in the wall, bullet holes, until the next day. And then the, I wasn't even home at the time. He he did uh, took a photograph and texted it to me, and we were like, whoa! I was pretty shocked to see that. So soon after that, we did call the police. And what did the police tell you? Did they come immediately to your house? Well, they did. They sent a team out. Uh, they checked the area for casings. Uh, they, um, yeah, they, I met with the detective at the time. <clears throat> I did mention that the only thing unusual was this visit from um, that individual, Pena. And, um, and they, you know, you know, they did take that information. And uh, so I didn't hear anything, really. I, I think that there was much more focus when Senator Lopez's house was, was shot at. I mean, this, uh, I think they realized that there was something going on. Um, I, my husband was very worried about it. He was suspecting something was going on earlier than that, that these weren't just isolated things. So, so that's when I believe the New Mexico State uh, police got involved and then 
um, <clears throat> FBI and others got uh, really focused, and this became a priority for this, for, for uh, law enforcement here in Albuquerque. And as you said, when um, State Senator Linda Lopez's home was shot at, um, her daughter, 10-year-old sleeping daughter, was um, nearly hit. She talked about um, uh, the dust uh, that um, uh, um, was on her as a result of the bullet flying. Um, in the complaint, and I want to bring in the New Mexico Secretary of State here, um, the complaint citing an unnamed source said Solomon wanted them to aim lower. These are the um, people he allegedly hired to shoot at the houses, though he apparently was involved with one of them and his gun jammed. Solomon wanted them to aim lower and shoot around 8 p.m. because occupants would more likely not be laying down. He wanted to hit someone, New Mexico's Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver. You run the election uh, apparatus system in New Mexico, as all secretaries of states do in their states. Your house, personally, was not shot at, though you went into hiding last year. Talk about what's going on here, this political violence at home. Sure. Well, thank you for having us on uh, to talk about this important topic. You know, I've been an election administrator in New Mexico at the local and now at the state level for the last 16 years. And of course, the last two years, I think, have been unprecedented in terms of the violent political rhetoric that we are all being exposed to as election officials. And now, of course, we can see the through line with Mr. Pena, a, a radicalized uh, pro-Trump supporter who not only took threats that he made uh, toward me personally and other election officials, but obviously into actions against uh, former Commissioner O'Malley and our other friends and colleagues. And I think, you know, this is a topic that I've been talking a lot about with the public that, you know, because of the big lie and because of the mis and disinformation that has been spread through a certain portion of the population so extensively over the last two years, we have now seen individuals like Mr. Pena, frankly, somebody who already had a criminal record in the past, uh, who might have been already disposed to commit acts of violence, taking that rhetoric as truth and changing from uh, a pattern of verbal or social media-based threats into actions. Um, I'm very grateful for law enforcement in our state, for the Albuquerque police and the state police, the FBI, to have acted so quickly once this pattern of actual violence was established and to take quick action to uh, in, obtain and, and arrest those uh, who were involved. But what concerns me is that this may not be uh, where this, you know, radicalized behavior based on lies and mis and disinformation end. Maggie, could you explain, as you mentioned, Pena had a criminal record. So how is it, first of all, that he was able to run for political office at all? And how did he get access to guns? Well, I don't know the answer to the second question. I think our members of law enforcement would be better equipped with that information. But what I can tell you, in New Mexico, we have a little bit of a disjoint uh, in terms of our laws around candidacy and holding office. So in New Mexico, a, a someone who has been convicted of a felony cannot hold a public office. However, there is no such prohibition for somebody to uh, seek office and be placed on the ballot. So the, the grand irony of Mr. Pena's, uh, you know, candidacy is that although he could run for office, he could he could never have actually assumed office had he won the election. But as you already stated, you know, this was a this was a landslide loss, um, and it wasn't even close. Um, and so, you know, the allegations of election rigging are just ludicrous. He lost by something like fifty percentage points. Um, but if you could tell us, Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver, why you went into hiding last year? 
Following the 2020 general election, as I think folks are, are very aware, um, there was a, a tremendous campaign orchestrated by former President Trump and his supporters to cast aspersions and doubts. Of course, we saw the most uh, visual and violent culmination of that with the January 6th insurgency attack on the Capitol. Um, however, I and many of my colleagues from around the country who conduct elections on both sides of the aisle, independents, uh, we were subjected to a massive doxing campaign that ultimately uh, turned out to be orchestrated by the Iranians. Uh, it was a website called Enemies of the People. My home, along with the home of uh, about 70 other election officials from around the country, uh, photos of our homes, our home addresses, our personal private information was posted on this website. Uh, and uh, they went so far as to create a, a Bitcoin wallet to collect donations uh, for bounties uh, for individuals who may be so inclined to commit acts of violence against us. So yes, I had to relocate from my home. Uh, I had a police, state police protection detail for several weeks uh, until that website was ultimately taken down and until some further security measures could be taken to keep my, my home safe moving forward. Debbie O'Malley, could you talk about what you think needs to happen, what your concerns are now? <clears throat> well, I mean, that, that question has been asked uh, of me uh, many times now, uh, what needs to happen. And I, I, I don't, if you're talking about security or how to secure, uh, you know, uh, uh, our uh, our homes and our you know to so that uh, we're not vulnerable. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, I'm a local official. People, I've I've lived here. I was born in Albuquerque. Family's been here for many generations. I uh, my constituency knows who I am. Uh, they see me at the grocery store. If they need to get a hold of me, they can. Uh, you know, that's that's the life of a local official. Uh, well, am I supposed to have a detail follow me all, all everywhere? Well, that's not you know that's that's not feasible to have that happen. Uh, so uh, obviously my vulnerability level was increased greatly, uh, and uh, uh, and I you know certainly have a higher alert in terms of my safety and security, and we're doing what we can there. But uh, you know, other than that. I don't have the answer. The access to guns is anybody can pick up, get a gun. I mean, we see this everywhere, and, and people don't think twice about using it. So um, I don't have the answer for that. We're going to end with uh, New Mexico Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver. Um, if you can comment overall on the climate now, I mean, you have the chair of the secretaries of state, Jenna Griswold. She's the secretary of state of neighboring Colorado, um, uh, who uh, lobbied to get bodyguards as well. Are we seeing this all over the country, not only for secretaries of state who run elections, but um, local level officials? I mean, what is, do you feel, the country coming to at this point? Do you see this white supremacist violence, um, far-right violence, uh, as only increasing at this point? What needs to be done? Well, it's a good question. You know, interestingly, I was just doing interviews a couple of months ago talking about how election officials around the country, and myself included, were, were heaving a huge sigh of relief post the 2022 election because the level of violence and threats of violence did seem to be uh, significantly lessened over 2020. Um, however, I, I warned at that time, and I obviously um, have to say now that we don't think that that is over, uh, that, uh, you know, particularly as we head into the 2022 election, particularly as we have former President Trump seeking the nomination once again. And of course, it is, it is he uh, and his supporters who have been the most uh, virulent uh, in terms of making lies and accusations about the election process, you know, that again, we can see that through line of what happens when you have this heightened rhetoric uh, translated into action. So to answer your question, yes, I think we are still 
security of election officials and public officials in general uh, now is top of mind. In my state uh, here in New Mexico, we are going to be looking at some pieces of legislation to keep public officials' private uh, home information less public, to make it less public. Um, and we are also continually seeking more funding and resources for security measures for those of us who run elections. Um, now we are also going to have to look at all of our public public officials. Um, New Mexico is a very accessible place. It's a small place. It's very community-based. As Commissioner O'Malley was saying, folks are used to knowing who their elected officials are, where they live, how they can get in touch with them. Now we have to try to strike a balance between that access and the security of our public officials because of this increase and, and of course, the recent events of public, uh, excuse me, of political violence here. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us. Maggie Toulouse-Olivers, New Mexico Secretary of State, speaking to us from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Debbie O'Malley, former Bernalillo County Commissioner. Her home was shot up by a right-wing Trump supporter who denies the election results. In his own case, he ran for the state legislature. Coming up, we'll look at Azerbaijan's month-long blockade of the disputed area of Nagorno-Karabakh, a home to mostly ethnic Armenians. And then you'll meet the climate scientist who is fired from her job in a federal lab for her climate activism. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. As we turn now to look at the growing crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh, a region at the center of a decades-long dispute between Azerbaijan and Armenia and the South Caucasus. The area is located inside Azerbaijan, but it's historically Armenian territory populated mostly by ethnic Armenians. Since December 12th, the only road linking Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia has been closed, effectively putting the population population under a weeks-long blockade. According to news accounts, Azerbaijan has at times cut off electricity, gas and Internet access to the region. Armenia's prime minister has denounced the blockade. The closure of the Lachin corridor is a provocation. Its goal is a new military escalation, and there is no need to take steps that are desirable to those drafting the military escalation scenario. The aim of this provocation and escalation is to hide the obvious need for a political and official dialogue between Baku and Stepanakert, and to remove this issue from the agenda. 
On Wednesday, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said Russia's ready to send troops to the Armenia-Azerbaijan border. In 2020, Russia brokered a ceasefire between the two nations. To talk more about the crisis, we're joined by the writer and photojournalist Rubina Magosian. She's the managing editor of the independent news site EVN Report in Armenia. She reported from Nagorno-Karabakh during the 2020 war. She's joining us from Yerevan, Armenia's capital. Rubina, thanks so much for being with us. Can you lay out the latest developments and why this is so significant for the world to understand what's happening? Well, thank you for having me and thank you for discussing the subject. Why is this significant? Well, the latest developments to start there, it's like almost 40 days, 38 days now that people, 120,000 people in Artsakh, nagorno karabakh are in a blockade. This, this means there's, uh, as you mentioned, also there's no uh, gas. The gas has been cut off. The internet is, uh, has been cut off on occasions. Uh, electricity is like, there's like electricity cuts every day now because they're trying to save electricity. There's no medicine. There's uh, not enough food. Uh, today, the recent development is that also um, a number of institutions, people are starting to work from home because there isn't enough heating and they're trying to save on that as well. Children are not going to school. Uh, so uh, it's a humanitarian crisis that's on the verge of becoming a man-made catastrophe. Uh, and um, this is what's happening because uh, the population of nagorno karabakh is blockaded and it's always already been uh, about 40 days, 38 days, and uh, there's almost no uh, solution in sight. I, uh, this, uh, there was a, a peace agreement that was brokered by Russia in 2020. Why was this violated now? How do you understand why this happened? Well, the 2020 November 9th statement, which uh, was a ceasefire agreement that was brokered by Russia, uh, basically puts the Lachin Corridor, which is the only lifeline that Artsakh has its connection with Armenia, uh, puts, uh, puts the Lachin Corridor under uh, the uh, authority uh, of the Russian peacekeeping contingent that's been deployed there. Uh, so here again, we have this issue as to the peacekeepers are there and they haven't, they're allowing this to happen at this point. Uh, why is this happening? Well, we can go into a little bit of what's happening also with Russia in the region and with you in Ukraine. Um, well, Russia's losing a lot of its influence in the region and with Armenia's, uh, or tendency pivot towards the West, Russia is not opposed to allowing Azerbaijan use a hybrid warfare strategy such as this one, which is blockading the only corridor that's a lifeline to would basically eventually pressure Armenia into an actual peace deal, into concessions, into what the Azerbaijani president calls uh, the Zangezu corridor into, into receiving it. And uh, basically also the added benefit would be the self-presumed self-ethnic cleansing of the Armenians of nagorno karabakh because uh, this is not the first incident. This is kind of like uh, been dripping all the time. The gas is not being cut for the first time. The issues, with, uh, issues are persistent every once in a while. So it's this hybrid warfare tactic that's also kind of meant to collectively punish, I think, the, um, the population of Artsakh. And Russia's allowing it because it also, uh, it's also kind of a punishment and pressure on Armenia to, uh, for its pivot towers to the West. Could you explain just some background, Rubina? This uh, crisis has been ongoing for almost 30 years, uh, this disputed territory. Explain how borders, uh, once the Soviet Union was dissolved, how were borders determined? Because if one looks at the map, uh, Azerbaijan is, uh, comes on either side of Armenia, and then we have uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, as the Armenians call and as you've been referring to it as Artsakh. So explain how this happened and what the effects of this have been in the region. Well, the effects of this in the region have been very considerable. That this uh, a conflict such as Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is something that can be manipulated and escalated and can basically 
become a full-fledged conflict any any moment. This gives uh, powers like Russia a lot of leverage over over countries in the region, especially Armenia. In this case, also Azerbaijan. Um, so the, it's been a frozen conflict for 30 years, but it goes way back. Uh, Artsakh has been traditionally, ethnically, historically Armenian. It was, uh, as was the Soviet policy at the time, it was just give, uh, given to um, Azerbaijan, the Republic of Azerbaijan, the Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan back then. It was an autonomous oblast. This is very into, uh, important to mention. It was not a full part of Azerbaijan, an autonomous part of Azerbaijan. However, as the Soviet constitution back then allowed, people could vote and decide which republic they wanted to join within the Union. So uh, at the actually, at the almost at the end of the Soviet Union, the population of Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, took a vote, decided to join Armenia. So, uh, however, Soviet Union didn't accept the vote. Uh, and uh, the conflict has been ongoing ever since. So their right to self-determination under the Soviet rule was not uh, respected. Uh, and then, uh, it, of course, with the fall of the Soviet Union, it grew, grew into a conflict. And it's very important to note that this is a heavily, has always been, at some point, it's been a 100 percent Armenian populated area. During the Soviet uh, times, it was majority Armenian populated area. So uh, historically, there's no contesting if this land is ethnically Armenian or not, or is this 120,000 people are on their na native lands or not. But uh, that's the brief history of the conflict, which escalated into a full-fledged war in 2020 when Azerbaijan attacked. Um, and still, we're, uh, we're dealing with um, um, hybrid warfare uh, situation. So can you talk about the significance of the Russian Foreign Minister, uh, Sergei Lavrov, saying Russia's ready to send in troops to the Armenia-Azerbaijan border, and what you feel would lead to some kind of resolution to the standoff right now? Well, uh, even if CSTO, uh, this was uh, said in the context of the CN Collective Security Treaty Organization, of which Armenia is a member, uh, even sent troops, which they could have done on so many occasions and failed to do, uh, which was their basically, uh, you know, they had uh, they had to do it, and they kind of towed a little bit of the Azerbaijani narrative there, as uh, played a little bit of both sidesism, even though Armenia was their security partner. Uh, as a member of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which says um, any um, in incursion into the sovereign territory of one nation is considered an incursion into the territory of the whole Collective Security Treaty Organization. Um, that would be, in this case, between uh, on the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and it would not. The CSTO, as a as an organization, has no responsibilities or uh, nothing to do with Nagorno-Karabakh or the Lachin Corridor because that is not part of the um, recognized territory of the Republic, sovereign Republic of uh, Armenia, nor Azerbaijan at this point either. As well, to be. Rubina, you mentioned, of course, the, the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which consists of six uh, uh, states uh, that became members following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Of course, Azerbaijan is not a member. Could you talk about whether both sides view Russia as a neutral broker, uh, given its historic support uh, and alliance with Armenia? Sorry, could you repeat the last part? I lost uh, audio. Is Russia considered a neutral broker, given its historic alliance with Armenia? Uh, well, uh, evidently, no. Uh, as recent developments in Armenia and around Nagorno-Karabakh show uh, that Russia is—Russia uh, uh, has historically brokered the— First, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, um, ceasefire, second, uh, the ceasefire. But however, as far as conflict resolution goes, uh, uh, Russia has proven to be more uh, so after self-interest rather than uh, peace in the region. 
Well, we want to thank you so much, Rubina Margosian, for joining us, writer and photojournalist, managing editor of the independent news site EVN Report in Armenia. We'll link to it at democracynow.org. She's reported from Nagorno-Karabakh during the 2020 war, joining us from Yerevan, Armenia's capital. Next up, meet the Earth scientist who was fired from her job at a federal lab for her climate activism. Stay with us. It's what everybody says, but I don't believe it, even when I close my eyes. Maybe someday I would rather go away. I would rather go away. From the bottom. The World is Falling Down by Dear Nora. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Tens of thousands of climate activists have protested this week against the controversial expansion of a German coal mine. Police evicted climate activists who occupied the deserted town for months to prevent the area from being mined for lignite, a highly polluting type of coal. Police used tear gas, water cannons, batons to clear the encampment. Medics say at least 20 climate protesters were injured. Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg joined the protests and was detained twice. The fact that all of you are here is a sign of hope. This is only a part of a much larger global climate movement, a movement for climate and social justice and racial justice. Literat, what, what happens in Literat doesn't stay in Literat. Germany, as one of the biggest polluters in the world, has an enormous responsibility. You are showing clearly today that the changes will not come from the people in power, from governments, from corporations, from the so-called leaders. No, the real leaders are here. It is the people who are sitting in tree houses and those who have been defending Lissolat, for example, for years now. The carbon is still in the ground. We are still here. Literat is still there. And as long as the carbon is in the ground, this struggle is not over. This comes as the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has condemned fossil fuel executives for deliberately misleading the public about the threat posed by their products. After a new study found Exxon was aware of the link between fossil fuel emissions and global heating as early as the 70s and even before, but spent decades refuting and obscuring the science in order to make maximum profits. He warned the Paris Climate Agreement's goal of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Celsius is, quote, nearly going up in smoke. And without further action, the planet's headed toward a 2.8 degree Celsius increase. Well, now we turn to a dramatic scene in December, when the scientist and climate activist Rose Abramoff joined a fellow NASA scientist, Peter Kalmus, to disrupt a meeting of the world's biggest meeting of scientists who study Earth and space, the American Geophysical Union. The nonviolent protest was meant as a call to action to address the climate crisis. Rosa Abramoff and Kalmus went up on the stage and unfurled a banner that read, Out of the Lab and Into the Streets. Science director at the Nurture Nature Center. Our science is showing that the planet is dying. It's terrifying. Everything is a risk. Well, yeah, As scientists, we have tremendous efforts, but we need to use it. Wake up, Can you please clear the or fire me to take action? You have to choose one or the other. Woo! 
This was not Rose Abramoff's first protest. She'd previously chained herself to a White House gate and to a fence at Charlotte Douglas International Airport as part of a series of global protests coordinated by a group called Scientist Rebellion to raise awareness of how luxury air travel contributes to the climate crisis. Until earlier this month, Rose Abramoff worked as an Earth scientist at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. But in a New York Times opinion piece this month, she announced, I'm a scientist who spoke up about climate change. My employer fired me. Her employer is the U.S. government. Rose Abramoff joins us now from Knoxville, Tennessee. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Dr. Abramoff. It's great to have you with us. Um, can you talk about the action you engaged in and your response to your firing? Sure, Amy. Thank you. Um, so, like you said, I was attending the largest annual gathering of Earth scientists. This was in December of last year in Chicago, where I presented work on the effect of climate and land use change on carbon cycling. And Peter, the uh, my friend who is holding the banner and NASA climate scientist, was presenting on extreme humid heat in urban areas. So these are very relevant studies. After we were finished with our professional obligations, we unfurled this banner at the plenary and made our plea um, to action. We were very quickly escorted off the stage um, by organizers of the meeting. We were expelled from the conference. And most troubling to me is that our work was removed from the conference program, which we had presented earlier that week, as if it had never been presented. Um, and then, of course, as you describe a few weeks later, I was fired by my employer. Uh, they, and citing this incident. And how exactly did they explain that? What was, what were you guilty of in participating in this action? Yeah, there were two explanations um, that were given to me on the very short piece of paper that was my termination letter. One was that I violated the business code of conduct, which contains quite a lot of things, and they didn't specify what exactly I violated, but there's language about maintaining the, the credibility and the reputation of the laboratory. Um, there's language about not misusing government funds, which was also separately cited as the second reason in the letter. Because I was um, doing this, I was, I was unfurling this banner on a work trip. And talk about the group Scientist Rebellion. What kinds of actions do they engage in? Sure. So Scientist Rebellion is an international group of scientists who are concerned about climate change and believe that the mandate of scientists, especially Earth scientists, really needs to expand. Um, so we typically engage in acts of nonviolent civil disobedience in order to um, demonstrate to people the urgency and the severity of the climate crisis. So part of our work is speaking up so that people understand the level of risk we're in, how much time we have left, what the carbon budget is like. And, and another part of it is advocating for what we think are obvious policy solutions, um, obvious policy implications of our research, things like ending fossil fuel extraction and subsidies, canceling global south debt so that they can facilitate a green transition, um, banning luxury travel such as private jets and yachts, and taxing, adding progressive taxes on frequent flying. Um, and so those are just an example, examples of some of the campaigns that we've participated in, um, advocating for loss and damage, for example, um, at con uh, the conference of parties that occurred in Egypt. So, Dr. Rose Abramoff, why did you risk your job and did you realize you were doing that? Talk about your philosophy around being an Earth scientist, uh, working at a federal lab, and engaging in climate activism. Some might say that that should be your responsibility as a Earth scientist. Right. I mean, I think recent events have really brought up a lot of these fundamental questions about what the mandate of Earth scientists, especially those of us who study climate change, are. Um, you know, most scientists of every flavor were originally trained by our institutions to be carefully policy neutral in all of our communications, both with each other, with our institutions, and with the press. Um, and and leave any political commentary, however obvious it may be, to basically everyone else. Um, and I find that it's really, that seems interesting to me that we sort of allow the fossil fuel industry, economists, politicians, celebrities, 
random people on the internet, you know, the, the youth which are leading the climate movement, everyone has a stake um, and a right to comment on these climate policies, except it seems those of us who have subject matter expertise in the area. Um, that seems like an odd policy to me, and I take issue with it. And uh, Dr. Abramov, could you also talk about some of your concerns now about uh, where the climate debate is going? A number of people have uh, criticized the decision by the United Arab Emirates, which is uh, hosting uh, the next round of U.N. climate talks. Uh, they have appointed uh, the CEO of one of the world's biggest oil companies to preside over the talks. Your response? Right. I think this is just another example of the way in which the fossil fuel industry has essentially captured every aspect of our politics. Um, you know, that they're heading this, what is the climate, it's supposed to be the climate mitigation conference. Um, and it's also troubling that there's so much, you know, either tacit or explicit support from our leadership. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of friendly rhetoric from the fossil fuel industry that they believe in the green transition and that they're planning to be carbon neutral by 2050. But I'm an earth scientist and I'd rather look at the numbers. And so let's take one example. The Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, which is the company which Sultan Al Jaber heads, is still planning to increase their production of crude oil from 4 million barrels per day to 5 million barrels per day while at the same time the UAE maintains that they're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. I don't see how those two things are going to happen at the same time. Um, and, and, and everything else that I've seen more generally in terms of plans for production and expansion from the fossil fuel industry across the world leads me to believe that this friendly rhetoric, this we're going to transition is fr frank, and I can't think of a better way to say this, but it's just total BS. Um, you know, the study that you referenced last week, which was published in the journal Science, confirms using a yet another line of evidence that ExxonMobil knew about climate change very accurately since at least the 70s and likely earlier than that. And, and you know, we, we know about the misinformation campaigns that they've been leading and obscuring, essentially bringing to a halt any significant policy action um, since, since those decades. And so, if, as a society, we're going to be successful in making a near complete transition away from fossil fuels, we really have to remove the power and, importantly, also the funding of the fossil fuel industry, um, their power, legitimacy, and funding. I think that's the only way that we're going to dismantle it, essentially, successfully. Dr. Abramoff, we are speaking at a time when this report has come out, Greenland is the hottest it's been in a thousand years. Uh, these massive protests in Germany, where, among many others, um, Greta Thunberg, the famous Swedish climate activist, um, has been detained twice, and she said climate protection is not a crime. Um, we're talking about the head of the oil company being named the head of the U.N. COP for next year in UAE, and Biden's climate envoy. Um, former senator John Kerry, uh, hailing him as a great leader of the COP, endorsing that decision. And under the Biden administration, you have been fired. Can you appeal, since you work at a federal lab, for them to rehire you? What message do you have for the Biden administration? Um, I'm not sure that I can appeal, mostly because I work in the state of Tennessee, which doesn't have very many employment rights. So um, UT Battelle, which is the uh, kind of subcontract defense contractor, which 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 manages Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, employs people at will, um, if, if, which, which essentially means they can, I can be fired for any reason. I don't necessarily, they didn't need to have given me a reason. Um, but you know, I do have appeals to make. So you know, my very first action when I chained myself to the White House gate was an appeal to the president to declare a climate emergency. You know, there has been some passage of policies since then, but nowhere near what we need um, in order to maintain the habitability of our planet um, to stay below the safer level of warming, 1.5 degrees Celsius, which we expect to breach at least temporarily this decade. Rose, we just um, have 10 seconds. What are your plans now? I'm planning to continue with both research and activism, um, and I hope to mobilize many more scientists and uh, 
everyone else to the cause. Maybe Please. you could be the next climate envoy of the United States. Dr. Rose Abramoff, Earth scientist, recently fired from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory after urging other scientists to take action on climate change. We'll link to her New York Times op-ed, I'm a scientist who spoke up about climate change. My employer fired me. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh.